Yo, welcome to Podcastville. The church of what's, hap of what's happening now is brought to you by, number one, Zip Recruiter. Are you hiring? Do you know where to post a job to find the best candidates? You know how hard it is to find great talent out there and how important it is for your business to get somebody who's reliable, good, smart? That's why we have Zip Recruiter. Find out today why Zip Recruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, my listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter.com slash church. Number two, listen to me and listen to me good. When I go to the airport and all these little places, I go with Lyft. Why? Because Lyft knows that their drivers are what keep them moving. So they do everything they can to make sure their drivers are happy on every single trip. Join the ride-sharing company that believes in treating its people better. Go to lift.com slash Joey today, and you'll get a $500 new driver bonus. That's lift.com slash Joey today. Limited time only. Terms apply. Kick that motherfucking mule, Lee. The church of what's happening now. Here you go. Old school. I was telling Lee, this song is fucking 40 years old. Kick it, Lee. I, I need this fucking speakers to blow my ears. What's with this fucking fag volume? Give it to me, cocksuckers. Oh shit. Three little hat black chicks in the background. That's all they say. Give me love. Give me all that you got. Are you fucking nuts? The church of what's happening now. Here we go. Ba -ba 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 -da. Give me love, cocksuckers. How you doing? Your host, Joey Diaz, my main man in the co-host chair, the one and only, the ultimate, the flying Jew of death, Mr. Lee Syatt. We learned something very important today, Joey. No, we learned something this week. <laughs> Never to put a guest on here that can't handle an edible, because now we're put in a bad position. I didn't book all the guests, a lot of people out of town, but we don't give a fuck, people. This is one of those podcasts where we chit-chat about a few things that have been on my mind lately, uh... And that's basically it. I got to go to St. Louis on Thursday. I'll be at the fucking uh, Helium over there. I haven't been to St. Louis in two years, so I'm excited, man. What do you get? What do you do in St. Louis? Like, what you, is there barbecue in St. Louis? I, I have no fucking idea. Okay, I'm going to write perfect. jokes, lift some weights, <laughs> and do five fucking shows, and I'm back on a goddamn plane. I keep it nice and easy. I do the same shit in every town. You know me, dog. Nice and easy, no drama. My Gord, uh, my agent, Gordon Warnock. He's a great fucking guy. I've been uh, talking with him for three years. We still have made a dollar together. And, uh, you know, he's been trying to talk me to write a book for the last three years. And I've started fucking six times. And because of my writing insecurities and the whole thing, you know, it's, it's taken years. And I, in a way, I wanted it this way. I really wanted to think this out and make notes instead of just rushing it like a fucking... Uh, and give you guys the wrong facts and whatnot. But the bottom line is, uh, last month, I was doing really well on this page, Lit Lift. What I basically did was an idea a friend gave me that he said, just write a sentence every day. Start with that. And that's what I did. Every day I would go back, write a sentence. Then I got to the point where I couldn't wait to go to it. And I would write a few sentences a day and clean up. And I'd put together about two and a half chapters. And last day, last month, one day, I go to just write in there and the website is down and this went on oh, for about no. three or four days and my wife you know she's a fucking private investigator she went online and went to fucking chit chat fucking rooms <laughs> and everybody was pissed that Lit Lift went out of business something happened with Lit Lift but it took my book so now I gotta start from scratch so to put myself in a position where I had to do this I'm hiring somebody from the month of 8 August and pretty basically I only have San Francisco and Ontario in the month of August so that's one week I have to be on a plane and for three week and a half weeks, we're just going to write this fucking uh, 
the three or four chapters to get in advance and to see what we have to do. You know, it's, it's a good learning experience for both of us. He's from NYU. But the bottom line was that throughout this whole three years, the thing that's driven me not to even send them this stuff is fear. You know, I'm sick and tired of dealing with fear. And I dealt with it for fucking 30 years, and then I started doing little things about it. Just little, little things. But anyway, to get back to this book, Gordon sent me a book. I always get little emails from people, and they send it to the webpage. And you know what, man? I know that a lot of you guys are aspiring writers. We just talk with writers this week. But this applies for everything. You know, he sent me a book called The Art of War for Writers. Okay, now I've read half of it already, but there was something I read in the interfuck induction that I had to write down on a piece of paper because it fucked with me so much. And let me tell you what this is. You know, he breaks the book into chapters, so the art at war is for writers, my modest attempt as a field manual for all writing wretches because I know how hard it is out there. Uh, following Sun Tzu's example, I'll keep the subject compact subsued under three main areas. Reconnaissance, he wrote this. Uh, the section is primarily about the mental game of writing because what happens in your head affects everything else. Dick Simon of Simon & Schuster fame once said, all writers, without exception, are scared to death. Some simply hide it better than others. That's the story of my life. You know, I've just hidden my fears and I've gotten away with it. And I know a lot of you guys uh, Whenever we talk about the subject fear, I get a lot of emails three, four days later that now they understood what was going on with them, and uh, we haven't touched on it in a while. And I told Lee, I go, Lee, you know what, man? I've been getting more and more emails from writers, and you know we haven't spoken about fear lately because this that little statement that a publishing company, a guy, uh, Simon Schuster, whatever the fuck they are, would say, you know, all exception, without exception, have some type of fear. What do you think, is there a difference between fear and doubt? Like, doubt in yourself? They're cousins. Yeah, it's fucked up. They're fucking cousins, and they and they come at you from two directions. You follow me? Yeah, it's different. So once, fear is bad enough, but then once he calls his cousin doubt into the fucking picture, that's when you really have a problem. And that's with everything. That's to do anything. That's when I first started stand-up. That's when I went to Alberto Crane School and drove out to the front and drove home the first two times. That's just fear. That's just something that, you know, and it's like, it goes back to what we were talking about a few months ago. This could ruin your life. Yeah. It could ruin your fucking life. And I let it ruin my life in many aspects. But I don't give a fuck if my life is ruined in those aspects. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm the type of guy that I won't go for a 4 o'clock audition on the west side because I'm scared of traffic. I've done that traffic, and I gotta tell you something. It ain't that fucking bad. It's worse in my head. Right. I yeah, always yeah. call you and go, I'm in the fucking car doing 90, I'm 405. And all of a sudden, I'm like, I'm not gonna get home till 7. And all of a sudden, I'm, I'm pulling up at 530. I'm going, how the fuck did that happen? It's worse in my head. And that's what we let fear do. It's something that it gets worse in your head. And then while you're doing it, you're like, this wasn't so fucking bad. What was all that bullshit about? What was all that bullshit about? It's like when I go get a needle. For years, it was this fucking three days of drama following it to, to, to for a 10-second needle. That's what all this fear was into. Yeah. Uh -huh. You know, sometimes when we have fear, we it stops us from growing. It stopped me for fucking 40 years. stopped me. I was scared to know if I could do it or not. And that's a horrible thing to live with. Whether I could do something or not, sure I could do it. But guess what? If I can't, I'm going to give it an all New York try. And I go back to this topic, and I know you people are like, Joey, we don't want to hear this. I go back to jujitsu and this fear I had of jujitsu and being on my back. What I did, that was like uh, two months ago in May, I think. There was a week after going to Alberto Cranes for a year and a half that I didn't go because of fear. Really? Yeah, because I was jumping rope or something. I didn't feel good, and I'm like, I can't breathe. I'm not going to go. I didn't go all fucking week one time. After going there for a that's how much fear affects my fucking life. You know, with the comedy store, I'm not scared to go to the comedy store. I just like to keep it 
to a minimum because I lived there at one point. I don't want it to get like that again. But you still get a little, I don't know what the word would be, but you still get anxious or whatever excited sure, for your stand-up. Sure, sure, absolutely. But with like jujitsu, for the longest time, I had this fear. So what did I do last month? I got a group on. I heard about this teacher. I heard about this school. And before I joined Alberto's, I had heard about this guy. And I heard about how clean his school was, how he ran the school. There's no timer in the school for competitions. He doesn't really like competitive. He believes in old school jujitsu, the basics, and that's it. So I went on Groupon. You know me. I found the Groupon. 29 bucks for the first month. And I went down there just to try it out. And last month, because of that week, I punished myself. I forced myself to go to jiu-jitsu as much as I could, and I went 14 times last month. What do you normally go? Eight. Oh, Jesus, okay. I went 14 times last month. This time, so far this month, I'm at six, and it's only the tenth. And I got all one next week off, so I could go four times. I found a new way to train. I go to Alberto's, and I go to the other place. The other place is a little slow. It's a lot more drilling. There's only 10 minutes of sparring at the end, but they work on a lot more technique. I go there now. I, because of that week I missed in the fear, I punished myself. I punished myself. That's the type of dude I am. I punished myself. That I forced myself to go to eliminate the fear. Eliminate the fear. Eliminate this fear. After a year and a half, I'm still fucking scared. And it was like acupuncture. For the first two years, I went. But I was petrified. The whole drive up there on a Tuesday, I'd be fucking petrified. And I'd forget that I had to go. And I'd eat an edible. And that would really send me into fucking Mars once I went up there. So, do you think, with like the jujitsu aspect of it, were you trying to find almost like the like the root of your like basest fear? Cause, yes. Because you, you yes. could have gone and, and like yes. gone to a writing class, but like you were like, okay, I'm, I really don't like being on my back. That will. Ha- Did you think it would help everything else? Or I would. Th- I thought it would help me in every other aspect of my life. <sighs> Just to eliminate that little, little, little fear that I had. It will lighten my aspect a little bit. It will give me more illumination in all the other aspects of my life. My relationship, my friendships, what I do for a career, or how I am as a parent. Does it just give you confidence, like overcoming a fear? Is it like... Absolutely. Yeah. Listen, fear is not being prepared. Once you feel prepared, you won't have any more fear. It's so weird. You, you think know? that's the okay. root of all fear? All right. Let me tell you something. I got a, I really don't like auditioning the last four or five years. Okay. I really don't like it no more. You know why? Because I can't see. I can't see, guys. That reason? Yeah, I can't see. But what that means when you go into an audition, you got to either have glasses on mm-hmm. or know the lines by heart. I mean, backwards and frontwards. Which isn't always possible. Which isn't always possible, but in after I've lost so many roles from not knowing the lines and going in there with glasses that I don't really like auditioning anymore. Okay. It's not my strong fit anymore because at some point I gotta look the glasses. I always bring the paper in to keep me focused. Okay. So I always keep it right in front of me to keep me focused. So if I do get in trouble, I could take a look on the sly. The last couple of months, I haven't really been. I got an audition two weeks ago. It was for this TV show. I put it on tape around the corner. When they tell you to put a, when you have an audition, you go to the studio, you sign your name, you go in. There's a casting director, an assistant in the room, sometimes a director. You go in, you read. If they want a call back. Now that means you're going in for the second time or the third time. The more times you go in, the more people are in that room. So the second time you might go in, it's for the director, and they might like you. Now the third time, you have to go in for the producers. The director will be in the room. In the old days, like, like, okay, we'll use the Sopranos, for example. Okay. When I went in for the Sopranos, I went in for the initial audition. Bam, did well in it. Once I went in the room with the 15 people, I fell apart. This was also 19, this was also 2000. I wasn't young as a human being, but I was young as an actor. I didn't really have all my acting chops then. I was okay, 
I could I could book stuff. I had booked Spider Man two. I had booked uh, a bunch of different jobs at that point. But this was when I walked into that Silver Cup Studios in New York, and I saw all these people in the room, David Chase and all these motherfuckers in the room. My hand started trembling with the sides in my hand, and I could have probably got that role. But because they saw that fear, what are they going to do when they put cameras on? And it's a two hundred thousand dollar day, and I'm doing that for fucking an hour trembling or not remembering my lines that's I was a great character then I was great but I didn't I wasn't confident and that confidence gave me fear and that fear didn't get me the the role in the audition so going back to what you just said what about that audition were you not prepared for was it just that you had just started acting what do you mean you said uh fear means you're not you don't feel prepared right you're not prepared so that's why you have a little fear if you have confidence you walk in there like you got the biggest dick in the room so what during the what made you feel like you weren't prepared for the uh, at that time it wasn't that i wasn't prepared it was a little bit of unpreparation uh i was still living in doubt about who the fuck i was these people if they find out i went to prison they're not gonna like me Right. You know, they're going to think I'm a fucking like, a kidnapper or whatever. There's some people who look at life like that, and there's nothing you could do. I just had all these little fears that all built up into one, and when I went in that room, I couldn't cover the spread. That's it, and I'm mad enough to admit it. But after that, I didn't really shake at auditions no more. Even when I met with, for Analyze That, by the time I went in for Analyze That, my fears had been tackled. That What happened in that soprano room was not going to happen again. So for years, I went in for all these roles, whether I had them or not. But it's like I told my agent the other day. My job, since I moved to this town, is not to book the role. It's to disrupt the auditioning process. Okay? What I mean by that is we were thinking about Lisa I had for this. And if he didn't work out for this, we were thinking of Alberto Crane. But some fucking chubby kid from Jersey came in, Joey Diaz, and knocked all our thoughts fucking aloof. Because now... And 9 out of 10, I wouldn't even get the fucking role. But it didn't matter. I had fucked up the casting process. Because when you write a role, you already have somebody in mind for that role as you're writing it. You see somebody. And then when you go in the casting thing, in the casting world, you have to see three somebodies. Just in case. So now you're like, okay, he's coming in, he's coming in, depending on their read. But now they see a fat little comedian that's coming in for a drama show. And he's right there with the two guys. That was always what I was going for, to disrupt the process. So they could put my head shot up and go, what are we gonna do with this fat fuck? What the fuck are we gonna do with this fat fuck? And I got really good at that for a while. So would they give you, I mean, I know you've said it a couple times. Sometimes I got the role, sometimes I didn't. But would they give you, like you just said, would they give you a different role, maybe? Sometimes, sometimes smaller, but now you're in mind. Okay. You're in mind while they're shooting, you're in their mind, you created a doubt with them. Did we do the right move by not hiring Joe Diaz? Oh. That's a disruption. That's a disruption. You know, you gave it everything you got. You went in for three reads. You were right there with everybody else, but there's different things to act, acting. Maybe you didn't have enough Twitter followers, which is very important today. Yeah, oh my, that's Maybe crazy. Maybe you didn't have uh, an agency that fought for you. Maybe you didn't have a manager that fought for you and called them up and let them know who you're with and what do you do and... You know, there's so many variables. So I'm not, I'm never mad about those auditions. The, the whole moral of this is fear. Now, Saturday when I was in Vegas, I, you know, I woke up and I went for breakfast and I smoked a joint and then I went for a little walk and I came upstairs and I don't even know it was a thousand fucking degrees. And I go upstairs and I go, I got a show at 7.30. You know what, man, I'm gonna work out. Before I work out, I'm gonna take a fucking nap. And I tried the nap, but I, could, I was charging the phone like in the living room, and I could hear the phone buzzing. Uh, and I heard it like four times in a row. And I go, who the fuck is trying to get a hold of me? And it was my agent on a Saturday. And I go, what the fuck does he want? He was like in Hawaii or something. And he goes, hey, man, you're going in to read tomorrow. They want, to, uh, they want you to recall, go for a callback. He goes, do you really want to go in for a Sunday? And I go, fuck yeah. For that thing I read, that TV show. So I was thinking about how how I would have reacted 10 years ago, maybe 15 years ago to today. I looked at the sheet, and the director was Ben Stiller, and that's what I was meeting with. Oh, shit. So I was like, fuck. I got to go meet with Ben Stiller. Now, let me tell you something. You have no idea how that could work. 
What do you mean? In what aspect? You might go in there and he's a nice guy, so he, he relaxes you as a director. You don't get caught up because it's Ben Stiller. And you lay the read down. You might also go in there. He might be a dick. You might get caught up with it and fail. You know, that's what I used to do 15 years ago. Yeah, even before you, when you just go the, through every scenario? When I put my, when I broke the audition down, it was two scenes. But the thing I put in the top was Ben Stiller of the page. Because I didn't want it to be a shock when I walked in the room. And it really wasn't a shock. When I walked in, he was sitting there reading some fucking paper with some chick and two bicycles in the room. And he goes, I'll be right with you. He came out, he shook my hand, the other dudes, and he went in. And then some chick came out and brought me in there. And when I walked in, I could feel the anxiety level getting ready to rise, but I wouldn't let it. I was like, this ain't shit. I'm just going to read for this guy. That fear was ready to start coming up, and I just put it in this fucking place. But I put it in this place because of the confidence. I didn't put it in this place because I'm a fucking tough guy. I put the fear in its place because I was confident when I went in there. From the time I got off that plane, I read those sides. I printed those sides in Vegas, and I fucking yellowed them out and everything. So Saturday night I went back after the comedy show and I read those things for an hour over and over and over and over. I read them without my glasses over and over and over and over on the plane over and over and over and over. I got home, I took a nap, I got up and I just focused on that. So when I walked in the room, I knew those lines backwards and frontwards with or without glasses. Oh, shit, okay. And there was one scene where I even wore glasses just to prove my point. Like, if you're in this situation and you're an old-time guy, 9 out of 10, you got glasses. So I even put the glasses on in that scene, and he was like, that was pretty good in the audition. Oh, cool. So in the audition, I read it with glasses one time and without glasses just to let him know I knew the lines. What do you... How did you put, the, like, the fear in... Like, when you said you put the fear in its place, do you have, like, a... A thought that you go through? Do you do anything, or is it just like a reaction now? It's a reaction. It's breathing. It's a little bit of breathing. Okay. Breathing through your nose real quick. Keeping your shoulders up. Basically, it was the mental part of it. I knew the material. Gotcha. And I didn't let him throw me off. You know, I told the story on here once that when I got grudge match, I went on the set. And it was the first time LL Cool J was working with De Niro. And the first two or three scenes, the scenes were nothing. They had to get cut because LL Cool J got caught up with De Niro. Uh. You look at De Niro and you're looking at his eyes and you're seeing Al Capone, you're seeing Henry Hill, you're seeing uh, whatever, Jimmy Burke, you're seeing fucking Deer Hunter, you're seeing Godfather 2. It's really weird. And all those images go to your head and just shut you the fuck out because I did the first time you see someone like really big yeah and especially if you have to do lines with them like you have to do scenes with them in a movie or something the first scene's always a throwaway because you get caught up even Spider-Man 2 with that dude when I saw him all I kept thinking about was Boogie Nights Doc Ock right all I kept thinking about was Boogie Nights him and that Chinese dude and I could feel it overpowering me. In the first two takes, I couldn't even say a fucking word. They might not even have the time, but like you know how we how you do like the pre-church periscope with the guests, and you talk with the guests to calm them down. I'm surprised after 50 years or six, however many years of making hundreds of movies, directors don't do that for like their star actors and just have like a, a get together with everyone they're gonna have to talk with. Mm. They do. Okay. For a couple minutes, they give you three minutes. Yeah, three minutes. And they tell you what they expect from you for this film and blah, blah, blah. But if they did what I do, take them, you know, when I do that to people, that whole thing, listen, you're my brother. I don't ever want you to do anything for me. When we're on the road, I don't say get me water or get me a towel. You're my brother. I get it myself. There's one thing I do ask you to do for me, and that's to always go get the guest. All that is psychological. I go get the guest myself. I do all that as a psychological way, because you slow them down. Oh, okay. I, I didn't know that. Yeah, you slow them down. So when I, if I was to walk out there, 
they start with the cocksuckers and the, you slow them down. Oh, and when they walk up the gotcha. stairs, they talk to you, and it's pretty funny. The last couple times, without even people thinking, I've seen, I've tell, I've, I've noticed you tell people sit down, sit right there. It's funny. That's the whole system. That's part of the whole breakdown to slow them down. Oh, okay. Okay. I didn't know it was so thought out. No, I could go out there and get you. <laughs> right. I don't. I make them slow you down. They're thinking they're going to see me. They see you. Slows them down. You walk up the stairs. You come into the back here. You always tell them, have a seat. We give them water. That's all a process. Whatever they were thinking, they're not thinking it no more. Oh. Okay. It's like when, it's like when me and you would get into an argument. Okay. About numbers or, or a drug deal that you're not supposed to be doing. And I go to Castellano's house. Not Castellano, the other guy, the Gambino. Okay. Gambino had a wife that looked like a grandma. So he would always make her answer the door because no matter how mad I was, she'd take the air out of your sails. And then she'd ask you in and sit you on the couch and offer you coffee. You never saw Carlo. You never saw Carlo until she told you to go into his office. Oh. That was done for a reason. Carlo uh, Gambino did that for a reason. He made her answer the door for a reason, to slow people down. Sit them down, or from coffee, and whatever they're in a rush to tell you, what's up, Lee, what's on your mind? That fucking cocksucking Jew stole my fuck. You're not going to say that no more. She just took all the energy out of you. It's amazing how much thought gets put into this, and, like, it doesn't... Like, for me, I'm just like, oh, yeah, someone answered the door. It's all a game. It's like when you go get a fucking condominium, one of those time travels. What do you call them? Time shares. Time shares yeah. shit. They have a different teams of people talking to you. That's to confuse the buyer. You know, when you go buy a car, like when you went to a regular place, like Boulder Toyota, you dealt with one salesman, a, a finance guy. When you go to a place like Douglas Toyota in the old days, you dealt with six motherfuckers and nobody took responsibility for nothing. Okay. And just said anything to get to the sale? Anything. And when you come back uh, later and say, well, Lee said I get new tires. Lee don't even work here no more. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it's, it's, it's all, you know, in the old days, if you went to the dentist. Okay. The dentist did an x-ray, looked at your teeth, told you what you needed, and then he fucking talked to you and told you how much it was going to cost you. No more. Go to the dentist now, you get an x-ray, he looks at your teeth, he walks out, some little Filipina chick comes in with a fucking piece of paper, sits down next to you and says, okay, this is what needs to be done. We need this, 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 this. You gotta come, come up with a thousand dollars. The dentist could tell you that. Why do you think she tells you that? So you don't get mad at the dentist, I guess? It's just a bunch of reasons, but oh that God. just started about 15 years ago. The dentist was never like that. They took a page out of the salesmanship. That's creepy. I never experienced that until I moved out here. Yeah, out here they it's took very me out of, They took me out of the chair. They take you out of the chair, sit you down, and then the dentist is nowhere to be found, and some fucking chick talks to you. Those are yeah, all tactics. Yeah, fuck that. Those are all sales tactics. Oh, I hated that. It's fucking crazy. It's crazy until you see them. You don't, when you find out the real heart of sales, now you understand 90% of the world and how it works. You understand when you see a a, a, a a trailer for a film right and you see what they're trying to sell you and how they're trying to sell it to you when you see a commercial whenever you see things you see how, when you see a fight for the UFC like what happened today you see how they're gonna sell it to you only idiots are falling for this fucking thing really yeah it's gonna be $99 to get in high definition pay-per-view I thought it was gonna be more if you uh -huh. support this you're a fucking moron I don't wanna see the press conferences I don't wanna see nothing no, not even a little bit? Another thing. Nothing. There is no part of this sales joke that I'm getting from these people. There is nothing that impresses me from this, and I see it coming down the pipe. I'm working that weekend. <laughs> it doesn't fucking matter to me. I'm not canceling. People have asked me if I could host a party. Not at all. And I guess that's... Because if, if you don't... If you watch any part of it, then you're buying into it. So you kind of have, so have to just say no. Just say no. I kind of want to see who wins, though. You'll find out in an hour. 
That's true. And you'll save a hundred bucks, and you won't be part of the fucking general population, which is the most important thing. Why? Why is that so important? Because you don't want to fall in that gap ever. It's so funny when I used to work for Curtis Sloat. Part of his pitch was, you know, Curtis in those days got his information when I worked for a sports service. Curtis got his information you know, from different people, and he had different scouts and whatnot. But one of the biggest points of information was what we'd give him at 4 o'clock. We'd give him our call sheets. And he'd look at what every sucker bought into. And then you learn how people buy into stuff and why they buy into it. The end of the Colorado Sports Advisor's speech in those days when I worked there was, okay, Lee, you don't want to fucking work with me? Don't work with me. Who are you betting tonight, fucko? And you go, I got the fucking Knicks and I got the Nets. The smart thing is for me to call you up and go, hey, no, no, not even call you up when I have you there. I'll go, listen, one of your moves is opposite mine. And I'm definitely coming in. I got a five star. We'll talk tomorrow and I'll hang up. My moves weren't opposite yours. I don't even know what you know what I'm saying? And one of them is going to lose. I'm hopefully. creating a doubt. Sure. If you're like the general population, you're going to lose one of them. Yeah, or you're going to lose both of them. Oh, God. So that's what I'm saying to you. The GP always loses. Why would you want to be a part of that? That's how they make their money. By the thought of the GP and what they think. You know, you bet New England for the Super Bowl over Atlanta. Not because you're a fucking genius, but because you're, I'm a, fan, you're, yeah. you're a fan. Okay, you didn't bet them because you looked at stats and all this shit, and you said Atlanta's going to defend. No, you know you bet them because you're a fan. It's the people who bet Atlanta for the fuzz. It's the the sizzle. They always tell you in marketing to sell the sizzle, not the steak. So does that mean like the most listen exciting I, aspect? What, of what's the special tonight, Joey? I got a nice twelve ounce New York cut. I make it with mashed potatoes, fresh mashed potatoes with butter, and I'll give you a house salad for fifteen ninety five. Got it. Okay. okay. What if I said, let me tell you something, Lee. I got these steaks that just came in from Omaha. The fucking cow was an Olympic runner. <laughs> okay. Okay, number two. I just had one of those steaks, Lee, and when it came off the fucking thing with some mushrooms and some onions, you could smell the seasonings and the fucking meat. That meat with some mashed potatoes, home whipped with butter, and I put a little red onion in there to really sizzle it. I got these tomatoes I got. Do you understand the salesmanship of that? Right, yeah. I'm building value and everything along the way. Okay. You know, when you get in a car with a good car salesman, they'll even sell you the rear view mirror. Look at that rear view mirror. Look at that. It's sturdy. You ever push your mirror and it falls off? Yeah, yeah. This is sturdy. Feel this. I can fucking put a gorilla on that. You know what I'm saying? When we give you a mirror, we don't charge you 15 It's a $50 mirror, but that mirror is never going to break. You sell that. Look at that ashtray. Look at that fucking ashtray. It's beautiful. You could fit 2,000 pennies in there or 55 <laughs> joints. They put value on everything. Okay, gotcha. That's a salesman along the way. So what do you, like, how do you take that and put that into your writing or... Or, or you're acting like, do you take those lessons that you learn? Always. Like if I'm talking to a, a potential sponsor or something, I always dope it up a little bit. It's not like me sending you an email, like some dope to another dope. You got to dope it up. A couple different type of words in there. When we, you know, we talked yesterday. No, when we spoke yesterday briefly. You know, those type of words give them a different the type of person that you are, even though I'm a fucking puke and uh, I got felonies and all that shit, it just makes them feel, you know, all those little words, not when you're describing, I went to this restaurant, it was amazing, no, 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 I'm talking about from the sales aspect of it. Right, you always say like the $10,000 $10, project yeah. with a $10 presentation? Yeah, how are you going to sell a $10,000 project with a pair of $10 shoes? Right, okay. You know what I'm saying? It's, uh, because the, the doubt thing is is my is the toughest part for me, <coughs> I think. I don't think for me, and uh, we the the other book, the War of Art, talks about uh, getting in your own way, interference. Well, and there's resistance, resistance, and yeah. there's doubt. Yeah. And they're cousins too. Oh, 
Doubt's the worst one, I think. Doubt's the worst one mixed with resistance. I mean, everybody who listens to this podcast, I say 50% of the people are struggling to find who the fuck they are. Mm -hmm. And part of the reason why they never found out who they are is because they don't let themselves find out who they are. It's that doubt that they'll find out the truth. Same shit I did for 30 years when I was snorting coke. I didn't want to know what I could become. I didn't want to know. Even though the fucking reports and the prison and so I could do something with my life, I didn't want to. I was scared shitless. What if I do do something with my life? Then what? Then I got to, you know what I'm saying? I had to give up my little party. And I finally gave up my little party. And now I could look at myself in the mirror and I got a little bit more confidence. And, you know, it, it, it all goes hand in hand. It all goes hand in hand, Lee. So doubt, resistance, you know, it's levels. It goes from doubt to, should I do this? No, I'm not going to fucking write it right anyway. To It goes from resistance to doubt. I'm sorry. We were talking, and it's a overused topic on all podcasts now, like the how people are mean online. And the thing that got me over it, and the thing that, that is really the worst part about doubt for me, is... I'm meaner to myself in my head than anyone could ever be Me too. over email. Me too. Like it's, it's like it's terrible. Me too. And I've been mean, you know, when I have doubt, I look at the doubt, I look at the reason, and if the reason's good enough, I let doubt win. But so many times doubt has been so fucking wrong in my life that I don't let it affect me no more. See, look, like looking back, and even now, like if someone asks you for advice or me for advice, I can see them looking at things the wrong way. Like their brains just getting ahead of them. I have a, I have an issue with myself. I don't, I don't think I see see that in myself. I'm like, oh, my brain, it just goes, and I let it go, and I don't see, I don't, I can't see it from the outsider's perspective. In which way? In, oh well, no, that person's not mad at you, or this idea is fine, or. Or you're doing good there, or, or what, like whatever it may be. How everyone talks themselves into like hating themselves, or thinking that the, the whatever whatever it is. When you can see that in other people, I can't see that. I can't talk myself out of it. I can't look at the reasons. And be like, oh no, doubt's being stupid there. You've put in the work, or or you did this and that. I just always assume the worst. The mental decision is the toughest decision to make. Because that's the one that's going to control everything. Okay. I don't know what switch I hit when I stop doing blow. But the mental condition, once you don't allow it, whether I stop smoking cigarettes or stop doing blow or stop drinking diet soda or everything I let go of through the years, doubt always said it's not going to work out for you. Right, yeah. You know, doubt that you can think of your life without fucking diet coke. Come on, how are you going to eat a fucking hamburger? You know, when it was cigarettes, is how, how are you going to smoke a joint and not chase it with a cigarette? When it was cocaine, is how are you going to have a good time? You know, it was all these things in my life that brought up the doubt. You know, doubt always is lost in my world. Today, I have doubts all the time. And the more the doubt, the more I have to do it. Ugh. The stronger the doubt, the more I have to do it. You push yourself to do it? Push yourself to do it, because that means... If you push that doubt, something good's going to happen. You think so? Like, I know so. I know so for a fact. I uh, know so for a fact. You have to think about things. Like when you go with anything, it's doing it the smart way. And to learn to do something the smart way, you have to do it the wrong way for a while. And that's what people never realize. That to do something the right way, you have to do it the wrong way for a while. And then one day, if you're fucking, it might take six months, it might take six days, it might take six years. You, as a human being, like myself, would say, this isn't working. This isn't working. It doesn't take a genius to know that this isn't working. Right. I'm happy I caught this in the sixth day. You know, and let's use it for a com I could use it for a common example. I could use it for the podcast. Mm -hmm. We started in the morning for a while, and then it just wasn't working. It wasn't working for my health. Right, It was okay. four or five days a week. I had to get up at five, four, and go to bed at two. It just wasn't working. So we made a constant decision. When uh, 
for a year, 14 months, I went to Alberto Crane Jiu Jitsu. And I went with the right intentions, but I went for the wrong reasons. I was doing stuff that was wrong. Why were you going? I was going just to breathe. And by breathing and laying on somebody, I wasn't doing anything for myself. I got involved. I started doing the, the drill classes. I started doing the tech, tech fit classes. And I thought about something. And I thought of it just like comedy. And it's like no good deed done goes on whatever. Punished, yeah. You know, when you do something good for yourself, something oh. good's always going to come from it. Oh, whether okay. it's now or in six years, you're going to see something. I read something and it said I was training dumb. I read something online and as I was reading it, I go, I'm doing it wrong. I'm fucking up. And I switched it around and it wor worked out. You know, and let's look, let's talk about the workout. Okay. Because I added stretching, I added ice bags, I added uh, CBD oil to my training, I added a lot of stretching to my training, and I added, like today I rolled twice. I could have rolled three times, I rolled twice. I took a breather in between, because that one roll, my, it's the law of diminishing returns. I want to come back tomorrow. Right, okay. So now, instead of working on three days a week doing jiu-jitsu and struggling, being sore, walking around, ah. Oh, I go four times, like nothing happened. I do the same routine. I come home, I put an ice pack on my back while I'm writing down the moves I learned. The ice pack is on there 20, 25 minutes. I go through my computer, my notes, who email me, who I, I send you stuff, print this for me, brother. I put that down, I eat, I take a shower, I wash, I wash all that shit off me, then I eat. It's a process, then that bag is freezing. Now I go do two or three more errands. I come back at four, and I put ice packs on my knees, uh -huh. both of those. So now the next day, I'm more refreshed. I started doing a little more and cutting back a little on some areas, and now I get to get more pleasure out of it, and I get to improve more because I'm going more. Very interesting. Instead of sitting there and going and rolling four times with four gorillas and then going home and while I'm eating, my fucking body's shaking, fuck no. That don't happen no more. Now I go, bop, 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 bing. I'm ready to go because I have a different effect to it. That's what happens after a while. It took me 14 months. I'm sorry. I'm not a fucking working out guru. I don't know about this stuff. But I read. You have to fucking read. You're very, in some ways, you can be very set in your ways. Anyone can. But I was thinking, like I was about to say that, but thinking about it, you do try a lot of stuff. You have to. Because for years, I wouldn't try a lot of things. And I would go, uh, no, because of self-stupidity or self-whatever, I wouldn't try anything. Wouldn't try anything. And now, there's not a day go by that I don't try something. I'm 54. I threw half of my life away. I do this podcast for various reasons, but one of them is for the young listeners not to do the same mistakes I did. Yeah, I go to yoga. Yeah, I'll go to a fucking ballet class. If it means I'll recover more and I'll get something out of it, you have to try shit. Right. Well, <coughs> and obviously you don't want people to go, like, to be a criminal or, like, to do that, but you, like, you just said you don't know how to do something the right way until you've done it the wrong way. Yes. So don't people need to make some of these mistakes? Absolutely. fucking -lutely. Okay. Absolutely. You have to make some of these mistakes, but you could avoid some of them also. You could avoid some of them by thinking it out. A lot of mistakes I did, I let addiction push it. A lot of mistakes I did, I let uh, my insecurities push it. Not a lot of this, the people that listen to the podcast have the same things that I had going on. No, and very I don't few have, people. And I don't have the same things they were going on. We all come from different backgrounds and different walks of life. But fear, doubt, anxiety, all that shit hits us the same. Whether you're black, white, black, you got two good parents, you got one missing parent, whatever. We all have those same fucking little insecurities. You know, today I went to a Cranes, and he's having an in-house competition this week. And after the last two months, I, re I made a commitment to go to Kansas City. But if this wasn't, if this was a couple of years ago, I would have canceled Kansas City. Really? And done that in-house competition on Saturday. And 
I'll tell you why. Because I don't want to compete at all. But this would be a fear. And like I told today, there's a kid that really takes care of me in jiu-jitsu. He's a really good kid. Okay. And he's a very good jiu-jitsu player. Very good. He works hard. He's there five days a week. He lifts weights. He's dedicated, but he suffers from kind of the same shit I suffer from. Social anxiety. When you wrestle with somebody, part of it isn't, isn't the breathing. It's the anxiety that you're going to get died. I don't know. That you're going to get beat up or something. We both share those same things. So when we roll together, I could see that he's looking in my eyes to see if I get an anxiety attack or whatever, he cares, you know. And uh, so today I pulled him aside. I go, you doing the competition on Saturday? He goes, no, I don't think so. I go, listen, man, you're here with family. Even if you have an anxiety attack, you're here with family. Nothing bad could happen to you. It's not like you're in Orange County and have an anxiety attack in front of 400 people. Here, it's your family. The reason why I go to Alberta is because it's their family. If I get an anxiety attack and fall backwards, I know Alberto's going to take good care of me. Right. He'll give me mouth to mouth, put a finger up my ass, put <laughs> ice on my chest, whatever it needs. Whatever that it takes, You're with yeah. family. You know what I'm saying? People ain't going to be scared. They know what your ailments are. They know they watched you breathing for the last year. They know, and, and even Alberto appreciates what I've been doing lately. I go, I take the middle one, then I end with one that I stretch. He's like, bro, that's really good that you're doing it from that perspective. If it makes you come in here an extra week, what do I give a fuck? You know, you learn how to work smarter. When we've been doing the podcast, right? we've learned how to work smarter. That's what people do. But by not doing it, you're not going to ever learn to do it correctly. Okay. Gotcha. And these all go back to fear and doubt. So I was telling this kid right out, I said, start with this competition Saturday. Here, right here, if something happens, you're here with us. We got you. We put ice on your neck, we get you a fucking acai, and uh, we sit with you until you don't feel like that, and we'll help you breathe. And he kind of looked at me, and he was like, maybe. And I go, if that works, then not even a mile away, there's another competition next month for blue belts. Blue belts, that's it, at VMAC, up the corner. If something happens to you, we'll all be there. It's a Sunday, 11 o'clock. I'm home that Sunday. I'll be there. I'll watch, you know what I'm saying? So you have to help people also. You have to let people know that. But people also have to let people know. People who have anxiety like me oh. are very ashamed to yeah. tell people they have anxiety. I'm not ashamed, especially if I'm with somebody. I've told the world. We've spoken about my anxiety on this fucking show a thousand times. Before I go on stage at the Wool Turn, there was a short period there. I was really getting fucking anxious like a motherfucker. And do you think it has to do, like, something with how you, like, uh, you, you like, it by yourself, you like being an introvert? Because for me, even just the thought, like, even now when I say, like, I've said a bunch of times, I, I, I wish I had more friends, I like to hang out with people. There's times that I get very nervous just at the thought of, like, because I'm so used to being by myself and being, a, and being, handling it by myself like the thought of being around a lot of people like that kind of freaks me out too i get it i get it in 2001 i started booking movies and shit and i would get invited to the screenings okay the staff and not even the big screening with the stars oh the casting the, the crew, premieres the casting crew yeah i wouldn't get invited to the premieres okay i did this movie called american gun with james coburn uh I did another guy. I did a few movies that were just one scene, two scenes. So I would never get invited to the premiere. Okay. okay. Was I upset? No. I, I, I just didn't like it. But I learned something from going to the cast and crew ones. I was getting just as much anxiety at the cast and crew ones as I was at the premieres. So I stopped going to the cast and crew ones. When I went, so, like, I went to that. I remember that James Coburn movie. They fucking hated me. Really? They got mad at me for cocaine and drinking. I wasn't... You know what, man? At that time, I wasn't even snorting and fucking... You know, it's just amazing how you get blamed for fucking everything. They thought I had gotten in booze or something. I was smoking dope on the set, but it was a, it was a midnight <laughs> set. Everybody was smoking dope. I was young. I had just gotten here. 
I didn't know that monkey see, monkey do. I saw people getting high. I started getting high, and I got the blame. Uh, so you know what these motherfuckers did? They cut me so bad from the movie, they just showed my hand giving the, somebody the gun. Like, that's how much they got pissed at me. But they still invited me to the casting crew. And just the anxiety of me sitting there waiting for my role to come up uh, was brutal. When I didn't see my face, but I heard my voice, I was so fucking happy. <laughs> Most people would be upset because they got cut. I was so fucking happy. Because, yeah, oh, my God. Then there was something else I did where I went with my wife. We did the whole date thing. It was at one of those fucking director's places on Sunset, the cheap ones, not even the real good ones. It's got it's called like Harmony Hut. I don't fucking know. They screened little movies. They had 90 seats. I went to one there that this movie was so fucking bad. I was ashamed to even be in the movie. But what was more shameful was how the fucking actors were acting. This was a fucking thing off Sunset. Nobody went to see it. There wasn't a person from the industry that mattered in there. Uh-huh. These people thought they were to the cast a fucking glee. Oh, no. They're hugging and kissing. I was so embarrassed. But when my role came up, Lee, I ran the fuck out of that. I couldn't breathe. That's the first time I heard of that. And I didn't say nothing to nobody. Okay? And then I did something else about a year later. And this one was like, like a medium big one. And it was cast and crew. I thought it was the one with David Spade I did. And it was kind of cast and crew, and I went in there, and when my, and the, my scene was in the beginning. My scene for four or five movies. Do you remember? I went on a roll of the first scene. Right. You said uh, Taxi, I think. Taxi, Analyze That, and that one with David Spade. I'm well, trying to remember which one that was. It's I don't even fucking know. It don't matter. And uh, that movie, when I went to see that one with David Spade... I thought my head was going to blow up, Lee. Again, I took my wife. I thought my head was going to blow up. And then there was a movie I did, The Mezzos. It was about two gay mobsters, and I was a gay mobster. And I took a bunch of people to see that one, and I ran out of the movie theater. Now, is it different for you, like, and if I you're said, home by yourself? Is it that there's people no, there? No, it's even worse at the house by myself. Oh. So I didn't know what it was. People would say to me, Doc, you were sitting there. And then you weren't. And then you weren't. What happened? I go, I, I just went outside to get air. And they never really asked me. And I never really knew what it was. And then one day, I was watching that fucking crazy dude on Letterman. And Letterman asked him, you know, Pirates of the Caribbean. Johnny Depp? Johnny Depp. And Letterman asked him, he goes, so are you involved in the shooting process? Do you look at dailies? And he goes, nope. And he goes, what do you mean you don't look at dailies? He goes, I don't watch dailies. He goes, what do you mean when the movie gets... <laughs> Uh, cut the first edit. Do you watch? He goes no. He goes. What about the premiere? He goes to the premiere. He goes yes, but I run out before my roles come out. He goes. So you don't like? He goes. I can't stand listening to my voice, and I can't stand watching myself. It gives me a weird feeling, and that's the feeling I get. Ooh. The yeah. only movie I sat in the premiere and kind of enjoyed because my friends were there was the Longest Yard premiere. But when I sat there with my wife, I got up. When I went to the cast and crew with some friends from L.A., I got up. The premiere in New York, I sat with my friends from high school, and it felt good. I got up a few times, and whenever I would come up in the screen, I would whisper in a friend's ear to throw it off. Oh, okay. I don't like that none of that shit either. That shit creeps me the fuck out, Jack. So, like, I, I was just thinking, like, it's kind of nice that almost, I'm sure... Everyone, even you, who seems to be so, like, uh, confident and all that, has anxiety and doubt. But then I was just thinking about, like, the people who you, the, who thought they were glee. Do you think they have doubt and anxiety? Or are those kind of people just, they don't... No, they have no doubt. They're too worried about the gluten. <laughs> the gluten-free bread on the table and how it's... Gonna... I, I think we all have some form of doubt or... Uh... I mean, I still have it, Lee. 54 years old. Been doing comedy for 26 of those fucking years. And I still go to a spot at the ha and I get nervous. I enjoy that nervousness. Oh, I it's see. not... I mean, come on, man. There's a thousand people listening to this podcast. I got a tweet today from somebody who's going to get on stage. I got a tweet yesterday from somebody who's going to get on stage tomorrow night at Helium for the first time. You know, I love to do an interview, do a documentary, 
and interview people who got into comedy to tell me the truth how long from the thought to the inception of getting on stage. There's some people that are just great. There's some people who went to watch Lee Syatt on a talent night, one of his employees, and they signed up and they got on stage. But there's people like me that from the thought to when I got up on stage, two years, three years, two and a half years, from the prison to the stage, it was two and a half years. And then it was a couple years to like full, do it full time, you said? Then it took me another four to really get... Four. To re- it took me two to get... Okay, there you go. It took me two years to learn how to work smart. It took me two years to realize if I was going to do this, uh-huh. this is how it had to be done. It wasn't working by my standards. Getting on stage once a week was not going to work. And thinking I was fucking Richard Pryor, that's not going to work, Joey. And that was my first thought. I had so many horrible thoughts like a lot of other people have. I had the thoughts of, excuse me, the thoughts of being discovered, the thoughts of uh, just going on stage once a week, and the thought of just doing an hour because it was just something you had to say and you were that funny. All those thoughts, that was the three thoughts I had going into stand-up. And I'm sure when you become an underwater biologist or you become a plumber or you become a fucking uh, engineer, a structural engineer, there's things you thought about it that, okay, we're going to talk about somebody neutral. My sister-in-law, Paula. Okay? Paula went to law school with thoughts of... Uh, the DA's office. There you go. Okay. She graduated, and what happened? No DA jobs. Why not? They were fucking a nightmare. There's lists. There's thousands of them, yeah. Thousands of applicants. And oh, yeah. When it, like, thousands. So did Paula cave? No, you can't. No, now this is what most people would have done. What? Okay, you went to college, you're an intelligent dude. How many people want to go to college, get a DA, want to be a DA, they come out. Paula realized it after what, 90 days. Yeah. Paula's not stupid. She goes, you know what? This is going to be tough. I'm going to have to interview and interview again and interview again. And it might not be L.A. And I, I guess you told me one time that it wasn't for another two years. Yeah, it, it's a weird... It's, it's like, a weird process. And then you and I were talking here one day, and we were talking about immigration. And I go, Lee, just drop it on her. She speaks Spanish. You know. Yeah. And sometimes what you thought you were going to do is not what you thought you were going to do. It's, you're really doing it, but not just that field. Right. I, I always thought I was going to be a stand-up. Really? I never knew I was going to be in a fucking movie or a TV show. I told you. if I thought that one day you would become famous and go, Joe, you want to be an extra in my movie? Sure, I'll fucking hold the fucking tomato at a supermarket. I don't give a fuck because I thought I would only be an extra. Now I'm acting with people. I've acted with well-known people. Okay. Did anyone tell you to be an actor when you moved here or did you do that on your own? The first manager I had said he was going to send me on an audition. I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. Yeah. I didn't know what the fuck he was talking about. He was like, Do you, uh, we know you're a feature act. You only make 500 a week. That's $50 if you go on the road. Okay. For him. $50 for me. I can't keep the lights on. But he goes, commercials are paying. Now, I never knew about commercials. That's how negligent I was to this whole art game out here. I'd never even thought about commercials, even though you see them every day of your life. Right. Who acts in those? <clears throat> and it was film and television. So I thought, oh, well, you know, I won't do any of those. And I came here in Feb- January, and by the end of February, I had the best commercial agent at the time, because they all shift. Oh, uh, yeah. Approached me. And they called my manager, and the next thing I had a commercial agent. I'm like, holy shit. And if I signed with them on Thursday, I had a commercial that Monday. It was Popeye's Chicken. Oh, shit. I went over by Sunset. You know the bay? Right two blocks before Fairfax. Okay. Going west, there's an audition studio there that's still there. That was my first commercial audition. And I remember walking in there and there being 60 people. And in the back of my mind, I'm like, watch me. Watch my, <laughs> s- watch my smoke. And me going up there, reading the lines, thinking I was cool for this commercial. 
and I must have read whatever. I went up there and thought I was cocky, and they were like, thank you for coming. And I called my commercial agent. I did great. I, I'll be surprised if I don't book it. I never heard Dick. Oh, no. And the first ten of them were all the same. I went in there thinking I was fucking Johnny Actor. And then I booked the real commercial, like three or four months in. After you learned how to do it? Well, the commercial has to be right for you. Okay. Okay, the, co the commercial game and the theatrical game are two different fucking games. Let me give you an example. Okay. When I went for a mob role for a commercial, I always wear a white shirt. Like a button-down shirt? Yeah, like a white shirt under the black suit. Okay. Or the gray suit or the blue suit. When I go for a movie mobster, I wear a black shirt or a blue shirt. You follow me? What's the difference? It makes me look a little nice. And you don't want to look nice for TV? No, you want to look like a mobster for TV. For commercials, you got to look like a mobster, but a little civilized. They want you to look like that, but not really. Oh, okay. So you follow me? I figured that out, because every time I wore a black shirt to a commercial, I didn't get it. One day I said, let me switch it around. I started wearing white shirts to mafia commercials. Started getting it. It added a different patois. That's funny that you said that, because thinking about it, I think there's this one commercial. Uh, it was like a... Go, uh, a DraftKings commercial a year or two ago where they're like, talk to your Uncle Bobby. Yeah, 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 yeah. I saw those guys. Every time I see that, I'm like, why wasn't that Joey? Because. And looking at it, he's a white dude with red hair. Because, so. I'll tell you why. Okay. Because every time they make a mob commercial, the Italian Defamation League raises their fucking hand. Oh, no. So all those mafia commercials, you see that run? They always run for three weeks. So that's why, like, I remember on one commercial they ran, they complained, and they said, we got a Cuban guy. We're not even attacking it. So for that, they played it safe. They just went with a bunch of Irish guys. Right, yeah. Or street-looking guys, and nobody got their feelings hurt. They ran the commercial. They whitened the commercials up for white and Politics, American, yeah. Especially 2-4 and Fox. Oh, okay. And ABC. 2-4 and ABC got to be by the book, dog. Fox, a little different. FX, you could fucking blow your mother up and sell a commercial for a fucking Band-Aid. But, you know, all for those the, things. The main yeah. four, you gotta be careful. Or the main Again, three. I did not want to act when I came here late. It was the last thing I ever thought I would do, honestly. Even though I was very impressed with actors and there was a lot of actors that I grew up to, that I grew up to kind of idolizing from Charles Bronson to Clint Eastwood and now Lord Josie Wales. Just certain actors that... I just really enjoyed. I never thought it would work for me. Right. When I came out here, they dropped the acting thing on me. And at first, it was a little hard, but then I realized I live here. Why am I not? This is why you live here, is to be on TV and film. Right. I don't live here to go surfing. I don't live here to go to Venice Beach. I don't live here to go to Gold's Gym. <laughs> I don't live here to walk around Melrose. I live here to do stand-up and, and now to act and now to write. Is it almost like <clears throat> like when you f first moved here, you're still like looking for spots? And how you said work work smart, you're, I have this free time during the day, might as well audition. It's like I was telling you, you know, when I first got here, even though your pride doesn't want you to get a job, I got a job. Right. Because I had a lot of obligations. I had a coke addiction, I had a big <laughs> child support. You know, you know, I was living in a fucking car. You have a lot of fucking, you know, and you know you can make money hustling from doing comedy. But what the fuck? Let me get a guarantee. Let me make sure I can bring home a nickel a week selling cigars or a nickel a week selling screws or a nickel a week. It's time. It's open time. What are you, fucking uh, Hemingway? What are you going to write in five hours? Your next masterpiece? Go make money, and you can write this afternoon. Come home at one, sleep for two hours, wake up at three. Spots don't start till fucking eight o'clock, and they go till midnight. You can write till five. But people have this fucking weird thing that, nah, I'm going to wake up in the morning and right now you're not. You're going to smoke a cigarette, drink coffee, smoke a joint and talk to your buddies and you're going to throw stupid ideas at each other. Why don't you go get a job, cover the fucking nut so you're okay, you walk around like a human being and then everything's good. And trust me, even with the money I was making, I was still walking around wounded. I couldn't imagine not doing what I was fucking doing at the time. When I got that first commercial, the first two or three things, there wasn't a dime that went to me. That all went to bills and debts and fucking God knows what else. Let me do some fucking shout-outs here real quick. 
Philip Rusty, Bazili, you know I love you, cocksucker. Robert Pauly, Tony Lacosto, Garnett, Anacek, Christopher Jackson, Ray Quigley, Larry Hartley, Eric Turab, Turabi, Talking Lair, my man took care of me this time in Vegas, and Super Cherry, I love you, motherfucker. Don't forget about me. Anyway, yes, if, if there's any writers... I've read uh, half of this book already, The Art of War for Writers by James Scott Bell, Fiction Writing, Strategies, Tactics, and Exercises. I've read half of this book already, and I'm blown away, which means is I'm going to read it again now with a little fucking notebook next to me, making notes of this. So this is, so this is not the same one as The Art of War? No, or, no, no, that yeah, whole the thing. There's three yeah. books to that. There's a couple books to that. Oh, okay. People from the show have sent me the whole collection. Oh. You know, the Art of War for this. This is one that Gordon sent me. Okay. And I guarantee this is one of his clients. And uh, it's James Scott Bell, The Art of War for Writers. If you want to, you know, like I said, I got a lot of emails. I got a lot of Facebook Messenger message. And lately I've been getting hit up for writing. Like, what's the best book? What's the best this? You know, man, there's 20 fucking good books out there. The one that got me, honest to God, was On Writing by Stephen King. But that was me. There was one I read some years ago. I don't remember. The ones I told you on this. If I bump into something that's really, really good, I will run it through you on the show. I'm also reading a book that Bob Lingus and his family sent me. The Three Lives of Jimmy Page. I'm fucking a quarter through that. This book is as big as the Bible. It's bigger than the fucking Bible. So I'm three quarters through that. So uh, once I finish this, so far what I'm reading... My dick is getting hard. So, so far, what I'm reading, I like it. So, I'm going to try to look up that author and see if I can have him call in and talk about this. This is a good book, The Three Lives of Jimmy Page. I really try to read, guys, especially on these fucking planes. You know what? I bring a little notebook on the planes. I never read on the plane. I get one idea, <laughs> one crazy idea. I try it on Thursday nights and eats dick. I never try it again. I, I can't write on planes. When did you get into reading? The seventh grade. Really? That early? No, I'm lying to you. When I went to Catholic school, there was one nun who made you read a book and do like a book report every. See, that's what killed months. it for me. And I, I would do, like, I did The Godfather. Oh, okay. Mario Puzo. I did the. Oh, my God. Jonathan Livingston Siegel. For her, I did, uh. I did four fucking books for her, like The Love Bug. She would make you read the book, describe the characters, and write what you thought of the plot. Typed three pages with a binder. Sister Anna, Sister Patricia. And that was when I learned a little bit about books. I thought it was a homework assignment. Right, yeah. But then when I went to Mr. Kingwell's class in the seventh grade the first time, When you're still in the sixth grade, the last day of school in the sixth grade before they move you to the seventh grade the next day. Okay. Mr. King will come in and said, Tonight, guys, go read a book. Go get a book. So he would give you a book to read for the summer. Yeah. And September 1, when you came back, you had to have a book report on that book from the summer. And the book I brought to him was Jaws. <laughs> I did Jaws the first time. But you had to do one once a month, Jack. Jesus Christ. And you know what? I just realized that. That's when I realized that if you're not into something and you read it, dump it. Dump it. It's a horrible fucking read. Dump it. If it's in your world. I don't care if you tell me, Joe, I've read this twice. It's the best book I've ever read. It's like anything else. Some movies I like, you don't like. Some movies you like, I don't like. You know, everything's not going to work for everybody. Right. But I realized that you really got to be into a book to really fucking sink your teeth like you know like I still know the books that have I wish I could become that's what my problem is that I'm a reader and when you're a reader it's really good for you if you write or it could be really bad for you because you try to compare yourself to those motherfuckers oh yeah but there's no way there's books I've written that I can write a fucking night with a crayon they're so fucking bad there's a ton of books I've read that are terrible, that have been done overnight, you could tell. 
but there's a lot of good books like fucking uh, the what's the uh, what's the like the, the, one of the best books you know Cujo of course and you know at the, the one about uh, Ross Perot and shit like that but one of my favorite fucking books ever was the movie the one with the chick the FBI agent Hannibal Lecter oh Silence of the Lambs so, yeah it was one of the best books I read. Have you read the series? Like the I read Red Dragon. Red Dragon. I read yeah. Red Dragon, Silence of the Lambs, and that's why. And then I read Hannibal. No, I'm lying to you. I did read Hannibal. I did read Hannibal before the movie was released. Or yes, and I watched. Uh, in fact, Jeffrey today, a friend from the Twitter, said a podcast listener hit me up and said he was li- watching the whole Michael Mann collection, which means he was watching Manhunter. Okay. Uh, thief and whatever he did like two or three really good movies back to back look up Michael Mann on IMDB and from uh, 79, 78, 77 Michael Mann did some heavy fucking shit man let's see here Jeffrey Collins hit me up today okay he He has 21 Jesus all right, but what was he doing in 78 and 77? As a director, right? Yeah. 77. Um, he did, well, his first movie was 81, was Thief. Yeah, because he started out, then he did The Keep. Uh, Manhunter was 83. Wow. L.A. Takedown, uh, it's a TV movie. The Last of the Mohicans was 92. Heat was ninety five. Right, but before those, all right. So he did. So he did Manhunter, and he did Thief, and then if you jump to television, what comes up? For um, for hmm. him. Oh, for Crime Dark. Story. Oh yeah, for and Miami Vice. He didn't direct those. I don't think. Maybe he wrote them or something. Did they say anything on that? Let's see here. Miami Vice or Crime Story. Police Story. Is Police that Story. He did Police Story from 76 to 78. Yep. Starsky and, and Hutch, he wrote four what episodes. Else? What else? Um, he wrote the screenplay for Thief. Oh, yeah, Miami Vice in 85. He wrote uh, one episode. And then the screenplay for Manhunter, Crime Story and Crime Story. Heat, Ali, he wrote, that's later. Drug Wars, the Camarena story. Yeah, the GG number right. And the story. last of the Mohicans. That's crazy. The Keep, Vegas. He did sixty-eight episodes. I don't know what that is. That's seventy-eight. And then he did that uh, that horse show on HBO. But it really, you know, that's irrelevant. It's just so weird how I like. I I enjoy reading, Lee, and I fly, man. And you can listen to an iPod for so long. Right, and you can fucking read a movie for so long. You know, you can watch a movie for so long. And I gotta tell you something: those books add up. Those books add up. I had to start reading them, and I said, "Fuck it." When I get on the plane, I know I'm not gonna be bothered. I got about a good hour and a half read. You know how much I could read in an hour and a half? A lot. You know, and then you take a little breather. Then you listen to music. Then if you listen to music for an hour, then you watch the TV, and bam, there you are. What is it like reading high? I've never read anything. Stone. Even better. I can I would imagine. Even you, better. Your you imagination put your little glasses off. on. You get a little fucking diet soda. You put your feet up. You take good care of yourself <laughs> and you read. And you take your mind somewhere else instead of the boat. But I learned, Lee, that I wish I would have done when I was 28 was learn how to take my mind out of the bullshit. Yeah, how do you do that? Because that's what kills us. That's what kills you as a human being when you let your everyday struggles go home with you at night and you absorb them and they bring you into different moods and they lead for you to drinking or whatever but that's not the whole thing just that stress and that worry upon your brain and your mental state and your central nervous system it's not good for you you know and I could how the fuck do you know Joey what the fuck after my mother died, that little thing I had of constantly thinking about my life and what was going to happen, it was wearing me out, man. It was wearing me out. 
And whenever I've had those issues, I could feel it. That's what kills you. Yeah. People say people have heart attacks from stress. What the fuck is stress? You know, it's funny what uh, our friend was saying last night that he has to work three weeks a month to make the rent, you know? And it's like the guy said in fucking uh, Fight Club, you can't let the things you own own you. When you start letting the things you own own you, that's stress. That's when you can't sleep at night. How am I gonna make that car payment? How am I gonna make that high school payment? How am I gonna pay for vacation? How am I gonna do this, you know? This shit will kill you more than all those subjects combined if you really think about it. Because there's no debtor's prison. And I don't care how many binds you've been in your life, you always seem to work yourself out of them. You really do, as an individual, you really do. Nobody's better than anybody else. Nobody's special than anybody else. Everybody in their life gets put into two or three dark situations. And you know what, man? You always work yourself. It's like the man said, you don't get what you want, but you get what you fucking motherfucking need, dog. That's so frustrating. It's it's frustrating. I I don't know, maybe it's just me, but as a kid growing up, even till like I think that's what I'm struggling with now is like you grow up and you, you, you th I just think there's an end point there's like okay you get to a certain point of success and then you can enjoy everything and, and, and relax and everything that I'm hearing and figuring out is that never comes that never comes at all so it, it, like that, it, it, it's that, if that's you, very frustrating if you don't you shouldn't it's not frustrating because again you're putting your head somewhere where it should not be whatsoever okay. okay it should not be whatsoever you know you know you're a, a good guy and i'll tell you what I'll, I'll fucking blow you out of the water and this is not to be funny or to be cute this is just to tell you where my head was at in 1984 which makes me 21 years old i went to the doctor because of blood coming out of my stool it had been coming out of my stool for about three months do you know why people because I would go to sleep worried. I'd wake up at three in the morning worried. And I'd go back to sleep worried. And I got the beginnings of an ulcer. They put me on that yellow medication and they gave me like low end whatever. And But the doctor kept telling me to come in and talk with him. And he was an old dude with white hair. And he was right there, so I go, okay. And he I don't know what his name is now, guys. I don't remember where his office was. It was Snowmass Village, 1983. It was the summer of 83. I was 21 years old. I had no family. I had a bank account with maybe $82 in it or something. I lived in a two-bedroom apartment. I, I, I was taking three credits a semester maybe six at a at Colorado Mountain College. And think about it. I had, I had no fucking idea. I had no idea. I had nobody I could call and say, hey, I can't pay rent. I need $600. There was nobody. I had to make this every fucking month. And I would sit there every month and sweat the month out. And then sweat the quarter out, you know. Even though I had a job, even though I had to go away to get to that job every day, there was no excuse. Like It wasn't like, I don't have a car. I had a way. There was a way. I, there was a bus that took me right in front of the place. I didn't have to walk a foot. It would drop me off and I had to cross the street. I had a job. I had a place to stay. At that time, I was robbing a little bit. I had a little put away. But I was playing with fire. That's a complete different story. But all that thought, I was wasting at night. I understood, thinking back now, I understand 40% of that thought. It's natural, but I was driving myself crazy. I was beating myself up. And it was just too much for that age. And you know what? That doctor, those six weeks I talked to him once a week, the blood went away, and I never put myself there again. I still thought but I never sweated it out like I used to. Till this day, you ask me things, and I'll tell you, I'm not sweating them. I don't worry about it. There's nothing to worry about. It's gonna either work your way or not. 
And if it doesn't, you'll figure out a way to There's make it work. Out, yeah. That's it. That's all fucking life is. It's a few curveballs from time to time. The big thing, listen, what's a fighter? A fighter isn't somebody who could, who could throw great punches or great kicks or take jujitsu really good. It's somebody who could take a fucking punch to the head three times when people go, ooh, and come back and knock a motherfucker out and win with his bone sticking out of his ear. Oh, my God. That's a that's a fighter. Like that catchy guy. Whoever. Yeah. That's what we are. And when people realize that, see, that's what you've never focused on. You focused on that. that does not never stop. Listen, you're 28 years old. All you gotta focus on, and your next next Thursday is your birthday. You'll be 29 years old. All I want you to focus on is 29 years old. That's a, I get. Okay. I my prom since birth. I want you to focus on the 30 day, the 90 day. And the 120. If you need to get a notebook, that's where you start next Thursday. And every week, pop, 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 pop. And I, dog, I write everything. If I'm angry about something now, I take the notebook, I open it up, <laughs> and I write the whole story out. And then I read it and I go, what the fuck am I mad about? I wish I would have known this when I was 29 years old. I wish I would have known these things, that there's no pay off and worry all I want you to do is do think about how you're going to do it and do it don't think about nothing else if you think of, today that kid I told you from Jiu Jitsu we rolled today right we rolled for a reason because I saw I learned something from him from watching him today okay that's why I told you it all starts with the mental you do a warm up you learn a technique you drill the technique you get water, and then you call breaking the guard. Where you get in my guard, and all you have to do is pass it. If you pass my guard, you get on your back, then somebody has to pass your guard. If you sweep them, you stay on your back. Okay, that's, they do that for 15 minutes in every class. So I was watching him today, and this kid has gotten so good that in his mind, before you even click hands with him and he grabs your gi, he decides that you're not going to pass his guard. It's amazing to watch his face and what happens. He just decides. He just decides. That's why I explained to him today that he had to compete because he's that good. I watched a guy 30 pounds heavier than him almost pass his guard, and this kid opened up and held on to his gi, and with his gi flipped over into the turtle position, and then grabbed the guy's legs and took him down. In his mind. So if in his mind he could decide that somebody's not going to pass his guard, mm -hmm. in his mind he could go to a competition and overcome this little anxiety he gets. Like I told him, you can't go to the world's first. You're going to cave if you go to the world's first. That's like if I go to Vegas next August and try to compete in the world's for the first competition. I'm going to cave and I'll probably quit jujitsu. A la Ronda Rousey. You just quit. You get such a beating that you just quit. And it's a shame. That's what happens. I moved a little too fast. I would do competitions at, at Cranes. I would just go, give me three blue belts. I'll give you 50 bucks a piece. You know, and I would start with five minute rounds from A to Z. The takedown, doom. And I guarantee I would lose all three fights. Okay. I don't have a chance in hell. I mean, I'm telling you this because of my breathing. I couldn't fight three times, five-minute rounds, seriously, speedy like that, unless I laid on you. And even then, it's not going to fucking work. Okay. But I would to overcome that little bit of fear that I have. I'm not prepared yet. He is. But I looked at him today, and I go, if you decided that people aren't going to pass your guard, you could decide to control the anxiety. Like when I was wrestling with him, I told him I have to stop for a second. I can't slow down my breathing. I've extended my time rolling, but I still can't control my breathing. When my heart beats like that, I can't slow it down, and that's what gives me the anxiety. I've controlled the anxiety now. I just have to sit there for a minute longer and breathe it out and just focus on my breathing and 
has the time uh so like when you start when you're rolling and you start getting anxiety to, from that point to the point where you have to stop has that point gotten longer now to have you are you are you able to deal with the fear what it's doing is it's percentages okay that's what i'm trying to say to you so I went from getting anxiety a hundred times, a hundred percent, to now I have anxiety fifty percent. Okay. Because the more I go, the more the anxiety will go down. Gotcha. If I don't go, if I take gaps in between, my mind will let the anxiety grow. So I can never let that happen. Before it grows, I go down there. Boom, boom. Like today, I was sore from yesterday, but fuck it, boom, and I'll go again tomorrow. Before you know, I'll go again tomorrow because I don't want the fear to grow. By the time the fear shows up, I'm already on the mat, and I've already overcome. You, you follow me? That's what I was doing. The same thing with stand up. When I got into stand up, I would get on stage once a week, and die, and then walk around like I was Joey Bananas. Like, oh, I did great. No, you didn't. No, you didn't. Then I would go down there next week and die again, even though I was getting on stage once a week. Okay. I had to change up the seriousness of my game. And 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 then that goes back to what we were talking about at the beginning: the being prepared. And commitment. Right, okay. Commitment is cousins with preparation. It is, yeah, it totally is. Commitment is cousins with preparation. All this game is cousins. You have to look at cousins. It's all the same. So commitment and preparation, they're all fucking cousins. But preparation, commitment in your mind, like I saw my friend do today. When I looked at his face, and that kid was past his guard, and he flipped backwards. He had no reason to, he could have hurt himself. He could have hurt his back and been out for six weeks. He don't know that. But he decided this kid wasn't going to pass his guard just because of who he is. And that is what beats anxiety. Belief okay. in your mind. You know how I know? I'm living it. You know how many times I've gone to an audition, walked in there, signed my name, looked around, and seen people that I've seen in big-time movies and I've sat down in the corner and I go, oh shit, I'm not gonna get that. Well, I just lost the war. I could tell you six roles I lost because of that. Because I got intimidated by who was there. One time, I'll tell you who intimidated the shit out of me. Joe Botafuco, until I left. And I go, why did I just throw that audition? Joe Botafuco can't outact me and he can't fucking out comic me. And it wasn't a big deal. It was some fucking disaster of a game show or a reality show. So just that one thought, it, it totally took you out of it. Well, and that happens for everything. That train of thought will happen for fucking, will take you out of the game. It did me for years. And once I started, like I was telling Paul the other day before the fucking thing went south, before the train went south, I was telling Paul he's sure that <laughs> in my mind, and I, and I say this, and a lot of people are not going to agree with me. They're going to get mad at me or disagree. I'm telling you people, because I don't bullshit you motherfuckers. I'm telling you that, in my mind, the training I got from the comedy store as a comic, which is a training nobody could give you. It's a club on the Sunset Strip. You're on stage with celebrities and stars. When you first come out here, that's a weird fucking world. But navigating through that training made me uh, a green beret of comedy. I always felt that the comedy store comics were always green beret of comedy. What does that mean? We're not your motherfucking first choice. You call us when shit goes south and we show up and they drop us out of a helicopter <laughs> with a knife in our mouth and two fucking fins and a scuba on our back. That's how I've always felt about the comedy store. Joey, what would you say a dumb statement like that? Why? Because I saw it. I saw people go in there that were mediocre comics become tremendous fucking comics, i.e. Ari Shafir, i.e. Joe Rogan, i.e. Freddie Soto, rest in peace, the list go, uh, Chris D'Elia. I saw a lot of comics that walked into the comedy store, mediocre comics, and midway, two, three years, somewhere, it snaps, and now you know your motherfucking mission. Okay? The improv has their own style of comedy. You've been to all three clubs. Right. Whether with Paula or with me, and everywhere has their own style of comics. But the solid homies, I'm telling you, the, the comedy store, in my mind, after like three or four years at the comedy store, the beating I was taking there on a daily night, again, it's percentages. Uh, 
Seinfeld said this in the, the Judy Carter book. The more you get on stage, it's all percentages. The more I go to jujitsu, the fear will go down because it's all percentages. When you get on stage as a comic, first ten times you're going to bomb. Second ten times you're going to do nine, you're going to bomb nine out of ten. Third time you're going to do eight out of ten. And so on and so on until your percentages is 40%, 30% of bombing. I still bomb today. 26 years of comedy, <clears throat> I still bomb. And when I bomb, I love it because that means I got it out of the way and here I come, motherfuckers. I got another 90 days because the percentages get lower and lower. Uh. I'm more prepared when I go on stage now. Even if I get myself into a dark place, I could navigate myself out of there. And that's all based on just working commitment. 26 years. Yeah, 26 Commitment, years. elimination of fear, 26 fucking years that I've been put in bad predicaments in all... You know, when you're a roofer, an electrician, a plumber, uh, all those c trades, and I and you do new construction, like there's people who do new construction, and there's people who do uh, what's other construction? Like they come in and remodels. Gotcha. Okay, those guys that do remodeling construction, those guys are great. When you do a remodel, it comes out great, and they come in and add a bathroom or whatever. All those things are difficult, guys. The reason why you're paying them is your expertise of finding problems and overcoming those problems. Right. Like, for example, you'll come to me and go, oh, this weekend I bought a house, Joey, I'm redoing the downstairs bathroom. I'll say to you, you're using a plumber. And you'll go, no, 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 no. I went, out, I went online and yelped. And this dude said to buy his cassette and do it. All of a sudden, midwife doing your tiling. Right, yeah. You don't know what you're doing. No. Now you have to call the plumber, and you have to pay him to do what you defy. If you paid the plumber, that those people, those type of people come in. New construction, you build. I tell you to come in and build this wall, 12 by 14, all the same. That's what you do. Build me 22 of those, 22 apartments. That's what you do. With remodeling and roofing like my brother-in-law's. They were fucking geniuses, Lee. Every time I went on a roof with those guys, I learned something. Like, I was sitting there, and everybody would say, listen, if you work with those two dudes, watch them and listen to what they say. It's the small details of their job that were like when flashing. Flashing means when you run into piping and air conditioners on a roof. If you don't do those right, they leak, and it causes a tremendous problem. When you worked with these guys, this shit never leaked because they did it and redid it and redid it. They did that extra time that people don't do to get it out of the way. But they faced any, like when I worked with them, I always learned something. And other roofers would come up and go, Jesus Christ, these fucking guys are geniuses. They were professionals. They knew how to overcome obstacles. Right. The more you do something, you, you learn how to o overcome obstacles. One guy got a hand it to in the stand-up world. There's one person that now I think about it, and I gotta tell you who's fucking great. He used to put himself in dark corners all the time. The reason why Joe Rogan's a great comic is because he used to put himself in dark corners, either by following strong people or saying something on purpose to try to get somebody's attention to work himself out of a hole. That genius move at a young stage in his career made him the comic he is today. He threw his own obstacles at himself. Which I did. We all do as comedians for a while because <laughs> by a, we want to try. <laughs> ah! That's a tremendous fucking fart right there, people. I had a little salad. Oh, my God. A little protein shake. That's what that, <laughs> that sounded like a fucking <laughs> Fourth of July <laughs> leftover. That sounded like somebody popped a bottle of champagne on the Fourth of fucking July tremendously. Oh, <laughs> my God. It was so clear. It was tremendous. It was. I didn't think even that was, people was going to be heard, but hey, I'm sorry. <laughs> Things happen, all right? If you don't fart, fuck you. He who, who live in a glass house throw the first stone. Oh, I'm always gonna. Let me ask you this: 
Because it sounds like you never get, like, that relaxing time. Are farts still funny at 54? Like, do you still have a good time when people fart? In my world? Yeah. Hilarious. All right, good. For me, not for everybody else. Oh, yeah, well, that's... For me at 54? Yeah. If I'm sitting there at night watching TV (laughs) and the two cats are next to me and I blow a (laughs) fart and they both look at me weird and I look at them like, who the fuck is running things? You know what I'm saying? And one of them always jump off. There's one cat that'll go, something ain't right here. Do you, like, angle it at them if they're sitting there? Well, if my ass is pointed that way and those two are looking at me. Well, a lot of people might just point it backwards or in, into no, the couch. No, 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 no. Listen, they're on the couch. <laughs> That's a privilege. It's if fair they want to be on there, this is what they're going to have to deal with. My feet and my fucking <laughs> asshole. You don't like it? <laughs> go back to the ASPCA and let them lock you up and fucking some other homo find you like me. <laughs> I'm the only fucking home one that's got six cats because I fell in love with them. Let some other... Today I was sitting in the kitchen (laughs) and I'm making that fucking protein shake before I go to karate, the the jiu-jitsu, the fucking little water so I can drink it at at jiu-jitsu. And Gray comes in, the black and white one, the the last one I got. I adopted her over there at fucking... uh, up the corner from the office here. And I used to play with her every day. And then uh, the lady downstairs, the cat got attacked one night. Like one night, I didn't see it. Like this went on for like a year. Her and I had this little romance. When I leave to do comedy, I'd see Gray. And when I come back, Gray would be waiting for me, or I would go Gray, and she would come running from wherever she was. And I had treats for her at the top of the stairs, and she'd walk up to the top of the stairs with me, and I'd give her the treats, and I'd pet her for 15, 20 minutes. And I'd go inside with my other cats. And then at night in the morning, I'd come out, and there she was right there. Right there to hang with me. And the other cats were hissing her and shit. <laughs> and I loved her. And I remember one day she disappeared for a while. And I was concerned. Like, I kept asking my wife, have you seen fucking Gray? They go, come on, let's get in the car. And I saw Gray two blocks away. And I go, Gray, Gray. And the only way we could get her home is if I got out of the car and she followed me home. And the owner of the house was like, I've had this cat for fucking six years. This cat don't like nobody. This is fucking crazy. So when she got attacked by the skunk or whatever attacked her, she ended right. up at the hospital with the infection. No. She couldn't live back outside again. So she came to me. She goes, I'm either going to put her in the pound or give her away. Do you want it? She loves you. And I go, no, I'm taking it. And I took Greg. And that was uh, how long? And I'm looking at it today. She's gained 10 pounds. She's clean. She's happy. I saw her kissing Demi yesterday. I saw her next to me, and I saw Demi walk up to me in the office. And they looked at each other, but they both kissed each other. She likes Demi. She likes Harry. She don't like Superbad. <laughs> She's constantly attacking Superbad. She stays away from the girls. She don't fuck with the girls. They have a lot more rooms to like att- attack each other in the yeah. new house. You're no, like- but she's on the couch constantly. But it was so weird how... That little animal in me, like I was sitting there looking at it, sitting there making the drink. I shook it up. I put the drink down. I had no food to give her none. It's like she was there begging. No, no, no. She just came up to me and said, what's going on? I just woke up. You know, I had to take a little stretch. I wanted to say hello to you. I bent over. I pet her. I picked her up. And it's so weird. When she, I pick her up and I put her in my chest, she just puts a little head. Oh, that's on, my, mess. on my shoulder, like she's thank you, and I pat her. She gives me about six minutes, and then she'll make a little meow. That means all right, enough is enough, cocksucker. I don't need this much love from you. And I lead, let it go down, and she leaves, and then I won't see it till nighttime. And I, I could be wrong, but didn't she get out a couple years ago and like escape, like get lost from she a fucking, while? She got out, and she went into the garage, and they locked her in there. Oh no! And I was fucking cracked. Listen yeah. to me. I was cracked. I couldn't sleep at night and shit. I was ready to call the police. I was fucking cracked. And I, uh, they opened up the garage one day, and there she was, just sitting there. She ran in the house, and she's never left again. She don't walk out that door. She looks outside from time to time. She goes, yeah, it's nice out there tonight, but fuck it. This is good in here. I got a cot. I watch TV now. I got a little fucking toys I play with because I play with them at night. When I go home, that's how I unwind. Just a little cat? Yeah, because mom is in bed, the baby's in bed, and the cats are out one by one. And once I get home, the later I get home, the more of them will be out. 
Like, I'll get home now and there's one out. And they'll play with me for a little while. The later you get home, there'll be two. You know what I'm saying? You get home like at midnight, there's like three out. And then from the energy you send out from playing with those three cats, the other ones come to life and they come into the living room. They got to play with all of them. They got to take a brush while you're there. See, and, and cats are good because dogs bark. Yeah, no, no, no. So these guys just purr and you're petting them. It's like one in the morning and you can feel the fucking energy in the room. You're brushing them, brushing them. Pop, 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 pop. And the next thing you know, fucking... One of them will swat one of them and shit. So then they'll be down to four of them. And now I have four of them. I have super bad, Harry, Demi, and maybe Gray. And I'll be brushing them, you know. And that'll be what's left. Then something will happen with Demi and Harry... It's such a weird combination, but now since I scratch their back, they have those different pheromones. What do you call them? Hormones. Hormones. Hormone. Hormone. On their back. Now they're awake, and now it sets that. It's really weird. Unless you have a fucking cat. I, I'm sorry. I'm talking about fucking cats, people. I just I haven't talked about the cats in a long time. <laughs> I want. We were talking about fears and shit like that. Listen. Anyway, I'm gonna be in St. Louis Thursday, Friday, and Saturday night, and then like I said, July 29th we'll be at the Borgata. Um, that's it and that's that I'm really sorry this weekend about the guest when, when, when all this shit happened you know and I couldn't recover but let me tell you something next week we got a tremendous week for you motherfuckers I'm happy that uh, you guys still support us and you're still in our corner we're here you know us this is the church of what's happening mom motherfuckers we're here before we leave though let me talk to you motherfuckers about something alright that's important to me Listen, man, you know, there's a lot of things going on right now. Uh, you know, maybe you're looking for a job. Maybe, I, I don't know. I don't know what the situation is in your life. But listen, you can never have more uh, enough money. Lyft knows that their drivers are what keeps them moving. So they do everything they can to make sure their drivers are happy on every trip. It's a simple formula. Happy drivers means happy passengers, right? You get in the car, the dude's in a good mood, he's talking to you. You tell him, open up the back window, blah, 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 blah. That's why, that's why 9 out of 10 lift rides get a perfect 5-star rating. You can earn hundreds of dollars a week, plus tips. You want to earn more money, right? The holidays are coming. Believe it or not, it's July, but the holidays are coming. You, you drive more. If you want to earn more money, you drive more. If you don't want to make money that week, you take a few days off. It's never been easier to give yourself a raise. Lyft was the first rideshare platform with tipping built right into the app. Because getting tipped shouldn't depend on your passenger having a crumbled bill in their pocket. You keep 100% of the tips, and let me tell you something, they add up fast. Drivers have been paid over $200 million since the feature was first introduced. And Express Pay lets you get paid almost instantly instead of waiting for weeks. Lyft has, has even taken the guesswork out of pickups. The new amp device uses color coding to help passengers find their drivers. So do yourself a favor. Join the ride-sharing company that believes in treating their people better. Go to Lyft.com right now, slash Joey, today, and get a $500 new driver bonus. That's Lyft.com slash Joey. Again, Lyft.com slash Joey. Get yourself a little job and a $500 new driver bonus. Limited time only. Terms apply. Let me ask you something. Times are tough. You got a business? Are you hiring? Do you know where to post your job to find the best candidate? No, you don't. Let me ask you something. Like I told you earlier in the podcast, you know how it is to find somebody dependable? I hit the home run with Lee here. I had a home run with Lee. You know how fine it is to find somebody dependable? Somebody who takes showers, somebody who you can tr trust, somebody who's educated. You know how important it is to run a successful business? Okay. With ZipRecruiter, you can post your jobs to 100 plus job sites with one click. Bam! Then their powerful technology efficiently matches the right people to your job better than anybody else. That's why ZipRecruiter is different. Unlike other job sites, Zip Recruiter doesn't depend on candidates finding you. It finds them. In fact, 80% of jobs posted on Zip Recruiter get a qualified candidate in just 24 hours. No juggling emails, no calls to your office. Simply screen, rate, manage all in one place with Zip Recruiter's easy to use dashboard. Find out today 
why ZipRecruiter has been used by businesses of all sizes to find the most qualified job candidates with immediate results. And right now, today, our family, our listeners can post jobs on ZipRecruiter for free, gratis. That's right, free. Just go to ZipRecruiter slash church. It's that easy. That's ZipRecruiter slash church. ZipRecruiter.com. ZipRecruiter.com slash church. It's that easy. ZipRecruiter.com slash church. One more time. Try it for free. Go to ZipRecruiter.com slash church. Again, I want to thank ZipRecruiter. I want to thank Lyft. I want to thank uh, Onnit. And I want to thank, most importantly, you guys. I love you guys with all my fucking heart. Without you, I got no gots, all right? I'll see you guys Monday, ready to rock. If not, I'll see you Thursday night in St. Louis. Get ready to light your wig on fire. We're going deep into the murky waters. I love you guys. Oh, by the way, again, The Art of War for writers, James Scott Bell. Thank you again for listening. Have a great weekend. Thank you.